This is Deborah Johnson for Women at Halftime, and I'm passionate about helping women use their untapped skills, resources, and talents to create their ideal work and lifestyle, making a difference in their second half. Hello, this is Deborah Johnson, and I'm so excited to be here with you today with this amazing subject that is near and dear to my heart making time and space for you with music and art. That is so much of my background, and I believe so strongly in it. And I wish I had a nickel for everyone who says, ah, I wish I had continued my music lessons. And usually that is after I am playing at an event or they they hear something beautiful uh, crafted on a piano and they remember those piano lessons. And so many people just quit at a certain stage, usually by high school, Um, but they've had that in their background. And many then express the desire to start back up on those music lessons, uh, especially on a piano, but they don't do it. And why? Well, the number one challenge is time, of course. And at halftime, we think that, oh, well, we'll have a little more time, especially if you are going to downscale a little bit more on your your work and all of your responsibilities, maybe your home responsibilities. Um, Your kids are getting older. They don't take as much work. But what happens is that we fill our life with so many other things. And the music is not one of those habits anymore that you get to every single day. And if you think back when you were growing up with music lessons, what did your teacher do? Your teacher required you to practice every day. And boy, your parents were paying for those lessons, so you better work, right? Plus, many have had to go through the, the experience of recitals. Now, some are just listening to that word and break out in a cold sweat thinking about playing a certain piece in front of anybody else memorized. But uh, it's a great opportunity to create goals and to keep uh, students moving ahead in, in many areas. So recitals, performance, all of that is just a part of uh, lessons usually growing up. But it might be a reason that you quit, and especially if you stay, if you face that stage fright. Well, I, my mother um, had, she played little games with my sisters and I. She had these little colored boxes that she kept on top of this, the upright piano, and she had actually painted it antique green, and it was in our living room. It was an old, old piano, I think, that somebody gave our family. And when my sisters and I, we fulfilled our practice for the week, uh, we'd get a small prize. And she made it just fun, as fun as possible. But she was very determined that we would practice because our lessons were a sacrifice for the family because there wasn't a lot of money. And she had to convince my dad that, yeah, this is really worth it. And I'm so glad she did because it definitely paid off. This has been a career that I've, uh, I've had for years. And no matter what your memory is of music, of art, when growing up, at halftime, you have to make the time and the mental space for creativity, including music and art. Uh, it's not just piano lessons. It's not just an instrument um, that you would get back to. It could be art, it could be painting, it could be ceramics, it could be almost anything. And it doesn't just happen. So today's episode, I'm going to talk about a couple main areas. We're going to talk about the benefits of putting that music and art back into your life um, a little bit more, and then also how to do it. Uh, just Just a couple ideas for you. So really, let's talk about first the benefits. I could I could talk about this for days. In fact, I've written a book about it. Uh, when I wrote Music for Kids, it's not just for kids, it's for adults as well, because there's so many benefits to music. 
uh, because creativity can have a powerful effect on the brain. And even viewing art, it can stir really strong emotions and deep thoughts. And it stimulates the brain in many profound and long-term ways. And many parents want to travel with their kids to art museums and all of that just to be able to experience that art. It's as, There's just something awe-inspiring about viewing a wonderful piece of art. And the same in music. Specific brain circuits are wired to respond to music. And marketers know this. <laughs> you walk into any store and start noticing the tempo, whether it's a slow, calm tempo, to where they're encouraging you to slow down and potentially purchase more. And what about the faster tempos? Uh, well, those, those tempos may increase revenues for businesses that need a quicker turnover of customers. And maybe those fast food restaurants, they want you to get out, uh, they want you to eat and get out of there or pick up your food. But that's very, it has a psychological effect on us. And there's increasing uh, amount of scientific evidence that proves that art also enhances brain function in uh, raising the serotonin levels. And serotonin in your brain is a chemical that the nerve cells produce. And the experience, as, as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, of viewing awe-inspiring art, it has that positive effect on our physical body and on our mental state. I hope I don't butcher this name, Sheila Mirajian, PhD. Well, she says, um, experiencing awe can give us a sense of hope and provide a feeling of fulfillment. Well, that's a, a very uh, true, true statement. The Research Center for Arts and Culture, I'm going to give you a couple little facts here. It's the RCAC, um, established that artists suffer less loneliness and depression than the general population. Well, that's interesting. Uh, and that's a, a big... Um, a big uh, thing that many people face as well, characteristics that they face when you have, uh, you know, your friends are moving away or you have different friends pass on. Maybe you have different relationship circles that you are now in and you don't know uh, people as well. And it's lonely. And maybe you're facing some depression and, um, there, there are these proven studies and statistics that, you know, adding that creativity back into your life. You're, usually, if you attend, start attending a class or you're now studying with some lessons or now you're interacting with more people as well. So that definitely, definitely makes sense. And it also, uh, the study showed that those that, uh, that pursued more art also reported statistically significant better physical capacity, and they did more volunteer work. That's very interesting. I'd like to keep my, my physical uh, capacity up. I don't know about you. And also, I think part of that is there's an others-focused mentality, and it's not just all about me. Uh, anymore. It's about others as well. So if you start volunteering and if you start uh, spending time on something else than just your own thoughts, there's a potential for less stress, alleviating the burden of chronic disease. And so the more we understand the relationship between creative expression and healing, the more we will understand and discover the healing power of the arts. And that came from the U.S. National Institute of Health. So there's a lot of studies out about this. Oh, and there's more. There's so many more. Uh, you can look online for even more. But neuromusicology, it's research that explores how the nervous system reacts to music. And I did this study in my Music for Kids books, great little book, uh, just with the, the benefit of music for spatial reasoning and how it enhances the ability many times in um, 
geometry and math and, and just being able to see the big picture of, of the world. And music activates every known part of the brain. And I know I'm dwelling on music a little bit more than art, but I'll get to it. <laughs> so playing and even just listening to music can make you smarter, happier, healthier, and more productive at all stages of life. I believe that. And it also uh, protects against some uh, memory problems and cognitive decline, even more so than other leisure activities. And I know many are doing all these puzzles and all of that, but but the the first part of the brain that is developed is re- is in that brain stem. And when someone gets did the study on this, when someone gets Alzheimer's, dementia, and and the brain starts um, d- to just degenerate, and and there's no uh, connection anymore. The part that stays is in that brain stem. And this was never more apparent to me than in my father-in-law, who was a brilliant, brilliant man, worked for Rockwell um, and read a huge stack of magazines every single week. And I knew this because he would pass them along for us, you know, to us. I was <laughs> just like, whoa, you read all of these and just ingested so much material. And the last five years of his life, uh, he ended up having dementia. And at the very end, he didn't know who any of us were. Uh, He was happy, but he didn't know who we were at all. But one of the last things I remember is going over to um, my in-law's home, and we did a little sing-along at Christmas. My father-in-law stood there and sang all of the verses to Joy to the World. This is a man who had no idea who he was, no idea who anybody was in the room. And he had his little bell. He was ringing and singing joy to the world. And I think it was that week that he passed. It was such a special reminder that that part of the brain is still alive. And I want to keep it alive. And uh, it's, it was such a joy to see. And it really solidified that fact that that little memory is still there. And many who have had parents or friends go through this, they know how powerful that music is uh, because they've seen it firsthand. And seniors with musical backgrounds, they score even higher on cognitive tests and show greater mental flexibility than non-musical counterparts. And I say it is never too late to start. So, uh, you know, if you're going, oh, I don't have any background. Oh, I just, I can't do that. I can't do that. Don't discount that completely. Uh, And I'll make my points here um, a, a little bit later. It's also, listen, even listening to music has been shown to significantly improve working memory in older adults. So there's so, so many uh, benefits to this. Uh, it can alleviate symptoms of mental disorders, you know, with the anxiety and, and all of those and those things. Art, um, when we're talking about art, that's the same sort of... Um, area of creativity, a little bit different because we don't have our ears involved in creating a ceramic piece or a porcelain piece, but we're working with our hands. And just the fact that there's that sort of um, digging in and doing something creative really gets you out of, of yourself. I think it's so, so very, very healthy. My mom was told she was tone deaf uh, growing up, which was not true. There are very, very few people that are actually tone deaf. Um, But it was because that she tried to play the violin. It was the wrong instrument for her to start on. (laughs) It was just as a tough, tough instrument. Um, But she was a wonderful artist. She made, uh, oh, she got into porcelain work, to ceramic work, had a number of kilns. And my sisters and I grew up, I call it, playing in the mud because we would pour the molds. We would uh, clean the molds. They become like chalk. And then you'd clean it, you'd paint it, you'd fire it, you'd glaze it, all these different steps. She did incredibly beautiful work. And she painted just detailed 
um, pictures that she would paint. She loved roses. And it was just such a release for her. And then she taught it. And it was just for fun. She didn't have to work. My father uh, was uh, was able to provide. And she, you know, it was that sort of generation where she was able to raise us girls and do little things on the side. She she did a little little businesses on the side always because she wanted us to have the little extras. But um, this was a huge, uh, turned into a, well, so-called business, but um, it, it just kept her going and going and going. And of course, when we, when uh, we lost her, we found so many projects that she had done that we didn't even know about. So, <laughs> but it just kept her busy and it was such a joy to her then too with her grandchildren uh, that would come over and our kids just have so many great memories of just making little figurines and painting. And one of our sons made a chess set out of uh, ceramics. And and, um, I have it put aside to when he has his own place. (laughs) And I'm going to be passing that along to him, definitely. So, But there are so many benefits in music and in art and the creativity of that. Just want to encourage that mentally um, that you make the space for that as far as understanding the benefit of it, because that's the first step. When you understand the benefit of it, then you can move to the next step in making the actual time for it. Now, as I started this out, uh, I did, that was the first thing I said is how everyone is so short on time. And in fact, when I ask that, like one of your biggest challenges, what are you going through right now? And it's usually a time crunch. And many of those who are at halftime, which is officially uh, age 40 and, above, 40 and above, but usually um, I speak more to 45-ish, 55, 60, that sort of area. But it starts sooner than you think. And many of those, especially women, are not only finishing raising their kids or their kids, they maybe they've had their kids late, so they've got still young kids, but now they've got parents to deal with that are getting older and they're in that sandwich generation. They are so busy. Like, how do they even think about time for themselves? And they need to keep working because you never know what the economy is going to do. What and how do you handle life? So... What you have to do is make the time. It doesn't seem possible, does it? So, but I usually encourage people to do a time tracker and going through your schedule. And you might find some things that you can do without. It's like clearing the clutter. When I look at my desk, I think, okay, do I need everything on this desk? I'm a creative soul. So I (laughs) I just... It's just who I am. I gather things. And the more I clear off, the better I feel because I think, oh, I can tackle something else. Same thing in your schedule, just being able to clear something. And when you decide to do anything else like this, decide to do it and be consistent. If you start to do it and fail and don't continue, it'll be even harder to do again most of you listening know that principle very, very well. But you have to decide, and this is how I encourage you to do it. Find a simple program that will have some accountability and that will work for you. It's something I'm very, very excited about um, doing uh, mid this year, I'm going to be starting this up, is a membership site for those who used to play piano and that want to play again. I had written a complete album with songs at about the intermediate level for those uh, sort of uh, people that were looking to do that again. Um, It's not just for people at the intermediate level. It will be those that haven't played for years that feel like beginners. But it's one sort of program that will be available for that. But there are a lot of others. If you want to start now, there's a lot of programs out there. The key is accountability and finding somebody that you trust and that you're, you'll, be, you'll be consistent. That is the biggest, biggest thing is that consistency. 
And if you're not able to be consistent, you know, you'll feel like a failure. And that's exactly what I don't want to happen for you, especially in this field. Um, If you're able to join any sort of a little membership site, like I will put together a a little Facebook group. So that's such a great tool right now, or even a little forum that you can put together. You're going to have some interaction with other people. So you're going to have a little group and there's accountability there and it makes it fun. The same thing will hold true in any sort of an art class or a paint and sip or a ceramics class. Um, You know, to do anything in that little space, just take the time for it to, you know, to go ahead and do it. I think you'll just have a blast. And if you're wondering how to start in music and you don't have a piano, get a portable keyboard. But you would find all of that in any sort of program that that you um, attempt to do and join. I think the membership sort of aspect is one of the best because you're not just taking an online course all by yourself. All of a sudden, you're going to go through that course with some others that are doing the same thing. That is so valuable. And so I would encourage you to look for something like that. So, and all of this, if you're able to apply even a few things um, in what I've talked about today in this fun episode, um, it'll be worth your time and it'll be worth your sanity, your health, and your happiness. So again, what a fun subject to make time and space for you with music and art because it's really it's so filling. So as, as I close today, I want to make sure that I'm able to tell you about next week. Oh, you have to tune in next week. Such a fun, fun episode. I am on with my husband, Greg, and this is the subject. Some of you are going to laugh, and you should, because it's really a fun subject. When a type A marries a type B... And I wonder who is who. You're going to have to guess whether I am the type A or B and whether Greg is the type A or B. But you will find out next week, definitely. But we're going to talk about the different characteristics and uh, what that has meant in our relationship as well. So I hope you join me then. This is Deborah Johnson with GoalsForYourLife.com and WomenInHalfTime.com. And I will look forward to being back with you next week. I'd love it if you listen, subscribe, and tell your friends. Thank you for joining us on Women at Halftime. Visit goalsforyourlife.com or womenathalftime.com for many more resources, downloads, and programs, or to get in touch with me. I'd love it if you leave me a review and tell your friends. So until next time, this is Deborah Johnson signing off.